Well, if you've got your Bible, turn with me this morning to Luke chapter 1. And this morning we're picking up right where we left off last week. Luke chapter 1, verse 26. We'll read this morning through verse 38. If you're like me, um, you're looking longingly over at the Advent wreath, resisting the urge to go warm your hands by it, but we're all in this together, so... Follow along then as I read, starting in Luke chapter 1, verse 26, we'll read through verse 38. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month for her, who was said to be barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. Let's pray over those words. Lord, we thank you for the story of this message. We thank you for the story and the faith of Mary. And Lord, we thank you for that message which was brought to her. The message of a son to be born, the message of Emmanuel, God with us. God, I pray that this message that I now preach would do justice to the message that the angel brought and that we would leave this place seeking to better serve you. In Jesus' name that I pray, amen. Well, sometimes, whether you're reading, whether you're with other people, Sometimes you need to read between the lines. Y'all know what I'm talking about. If you've ever heard something along the lines of when you're in a group and somebody says, Oh, 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 you, you heard about, you heard about the party? Well, of course we, we would love for you to come. We can all read between the lines there, right? We all know the sincerity of that invitation. We can read it in the body language. We can read it in the tone. We know what's really being said versus the words that are being said. Or if that person was to then get to that party and was to have been there for a little while now, and then the host of the party was to get up and start doing the dishes and was to comment that, boy, it really is getting late and was then to go into the bedroom and put on some pajamas. We could read between the lines, right, and know what was being communicated in that moment, even though it was not being said explicitly. Well, I suspect that there is a message being delivered between the lines in this passage by Mary to the angel. We're talking this month about the preponderance of times in the gospel's infancy narratives. The stories of John the Baptist's birth and of Jesus' birth. All the times that the earthly is suddenly confronted by the heavenly. The worldly by the other worldly. All these angelic appearances and messages in dreams And eventually, on that starry night in Bethlehem, a heavenly host singing praises before lowly shepherds. 
Well, today we see how the mother of our Lord responded when she was confronted by the holy. We've read the exact words here, but if we look closely, if we read between the lines, I think there's something we can see Mary telling the angel Gabriel. I think the underlying message that she says to Gabriel several times is angel, messenger of God, I think you've got the wrong house. You don't belong here. We tend to respond to the presence of God in just that way, I think. Blinded by fear, by doubt, by a sense of unworthiness, we have a tendency to assume that we have no role in the plan of God. Advent serves as our reminder, church family. God is not just with them, the people who have it all put together. God is not just with them, the ones who have it all figured out. No, God is with us. So this message I'm seeing between the lines that Mary's giving to Gabriel, this message that maybe you've got the wrong house, this message that you don't belong here, I detect it first from Gabriel's introduction to Mary. He says, greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. And then seeing her face, seeing that she is perplexed, seeing that she is confused, the next words out of his mouth are, do not be afraid. That's a pretty common refrain from angels when they come to earth and speak to mortal men and mortal women. They commonly say, do not be afraid. It's the first thing that they usually say when making some visit to our world. For one thing, angels don't look like precious moments figurines, despite what Hallmark would tell you. Angels are messengers from God, angels are worshipers of God, and angels are warriors for God. When they're described in Isaiah, the angels pictured there are fearsome beings. In Revelation, they are not to be trifled with. So when angels show up, whatever their appearance, it's frightening for the average person. Second of all, we got to keep in mind, no one is ever expecting an angel to show up. Nobody ever wakes up one morning thinking, today's the day, I'm going to wake up, I'm going to make my coffee, I'm going to make my bed, and then that's when the angel's going to show up. No, these are always surprise appearances. Nobody ever sees these coming. So when an angel of the Lord shows up in your living room, it's going to take you off guard. But the third reason I think Mary may have been afraid, I wonder if she feared the message that Gabriel was bringing her. If she was intimidated by that which he had to say. This message that the Son of God was on his way. This message that the Messiah, the anointed one from God, would soon be among men and that she would be his mother. That she would be responsible for raising this one that her ancestors had dreamed about. It'd be enough to put anybody on their heels, I suspect. Mary's initial response when confronted by God, when confronted by this messenger from the Lord, this angel of the Lord, her initial response is what anybody's is when we are faced with something so much bigger than we are. <clears throat> she was afraid. When folks go to Mount Everest to climb the mountain, it's a more common thing now than it used to be thanks to technology, thanks to enough people who have done it now. But yet when people stare at it for the first time, after months and months and months of training, they often say that they are frightened by what they see. Frightened by what awaits them. That they're intimidated by the prospect of what they are about to do in climbing this mountain. But there's good news for them, of course. They don't climb it single-handed. Nobody climbs Mount Everest single-handed. Only a handful have done it in history. And so many have tried and failed 
that Nepal actually outlawed the practice just last year. If you are going to climb Mount Everest today, you must take not only supplemental oxygen, everybody's favorite companion on something like that, but you must also take one of the Sherpas, one of the folks who lives there, whose job it is to bring travelers up the mountain, one of the ones who knows the terrain, who knows the weather. If you're gonna climb Mount Everest, you have to go with somebody else. No one faced Everest alone. That is Gabriel's answer to Mary. Frightened by her mission, afraid of what is to come, afraid of this emblem of God's presence standing before her, Gabriel's answer to that fear is to tell her, do not be afraid, the Lord is with you. That's a message that we need today. Because we still fear what following God will mean for our lives. God has given every believer a mission. He has called us to go and make disciples of all nations. To baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. To teach what Christ has commanded us. But there's that promise at the end. He will be with us always. We worry about the mission that God's given us. We worry, are we up to the task? Can we pull it off? Do we have what it takes? And the answer from our Lord is, I will be with you. Emmanuel, God is with us. So if Mary's first concern is just simple fear at what stands before her, at the mission laid in front of her, at this angel standing in front of her. Her second is probably the one that makes the most sense. It's in verse 34, after Gabriel tells her what her task will be. She asks him, quick technical question, how will this be since I am a virgin? I'm not going to give the birds and the bees talk right now, but you know what she's asking there. How am I to give birth if I'm a virgin? How is that even possible? How could something like that happen? It doesn't make any sense. It's utterly unfathomable. So she presents Gabriel next after fear with doubt. Okay, I think you found the wrong house. I'm not sure you belong here. This must be a message for someone else. The message that I, a virgin, am to be a mother, that can't be for me. That's impossible. You don't belong here. You need to find somebody else. Literally what she wants to know is how could this be possible? Reminded of, in Gabriel's answer, the story of a man named Ari Offsevit, who ran the Boston Marathon in 2016. Ari had been training for months and months and months, and he had a goal that he was committed to. His goal was to run the Boston Marathon in three hours or less. For context, I ran slash walked the one marathon I participated in in just shy of five hours. So three is, for me, unfathomable, impossible, beyond the reach of reason. That's, that's crazy talk to run it in under three hours, but that was his goal. And he trained and he thought that by race day, he might be able to pull it off. It was an unseasonably warm day, the morning of the 2016 Boston Marathon. He was a little concerned about that, but he was determined to reach his goal. And sure enough, he was right on pace by the time that he reached mile 26. Just one, just two tenths, excuse me, of a mile to go before you get to the finish line. But he didn't feel good. He wondered if his legs could take him even one more step. He felt that way you feel when you are getting very, very sick and very, very feverish. And finally, in this quest to make sure that mind excelled over matter, 
Matter won the day. He collapsed to the ground just a fifth of a mile away from the finish line. Some runners behind him saw what had happened. Picked him up. One grabbed one arm, put it around shoulder. The other grabbed the other arm. And they set their goals to the side. And they carried Ari off Sevet across the finish line. He finished the race just three minutes over his goal. Promptly received medical attention. His life was saved by their actions that day. And he never could have done it by himself. He could not have finished the race. He could not have made it across alone. It would have been impossible. Mary came to Gabriel with this objection between the lines. How can God do this thing you say he will do? How could I be mother to the Messiah? It is impossible. And his answer to her is this. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. Simply put, God will be with you. That's how this will happen. How will this be? God will be with you. We need to hear that today. Because just like Mary, we also still harbor doubts about following God's will in our lives. We too wonder, is it possible to live as Jesus calls us to live? Is it possible to love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you? Is it possible to be a light in a dark world? Is it possible to be salt in this world? Can anybody actually do all this stuff? Or is it just some pie in the sky ideal? We wonder, we doubt, we wonder who can live like God teaches us to live. Who can be the kind of disciple God calls us to be? The answer for us is the same that it was for Mary. God is with us. You don't do it alone. You don't try to be a disciple to Jesus by yourself. This isn't a solo project we're on. God is with us. <clears throat> One last thing between the lines that I see from Mary in that same question. How can this be? Gabriel, you say that I'm to be the mother to the Messiah, that I'm supposed to raise the Christ that I'm supposed to give birth to and bring up this one who will save the world. How can this be? I do think that she's asking on the one hand, how is this possible? What's the metaphysics of this look like? But I think there's something else there. How can this be? I'm a virgin, yes. But also, how can this be? I'm too young for this task. Mary, barely a teenager. How can this be? I'm still unmarried. I'm nobody in this village. I'm still tied to my father's family name. Why would it be me? How can this be? I'm from Nazareth, backwater town, not Jerusalem. How can this be? I'm of low status. I'm not anybody special. How can this be? Gabriel, you got the wrong house. You don't belong. If she was wondering that, if those thoughts were racing through her mind when she asked this question, how can this be? I can identify with that. I've asked myself that before almost every big moment of my life. Before I got married, Am I ready for this, 21 years old? Am I prepared for this? Can I do this? When y'all called me to be pastor, just a little over 21 years old, am I ready for this? Can I do this? Is this something I'm capable of? When I became a father, can I pull this off? Can I be the kind of father God wants me to be? Can I do this? 
How can this be? Gabriel's answer to Mary on this front is really no answer. He doesn't really address that particular concern, the concern of her unworthiness. Instead, he just tells her what's going to happen. She asks, how can this be since I'm a virgin? Angel said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. And the child to be born will be holy. He will be called the Son of God. Simply put, how can I be worthy enough for this task? Gabriel seems to tell her, it doesn't really matter that much. What matters is that God is with you. We need to hear that today, church family. We need to hear that today because even more than fear, even more than doubt, there is this sense of unworthiness that plagues each and every one of us. This sense that God can't possibly use us. That we are too young or too old. That we have too many responsibilities or too few resources. This sense that we are the wrong person for the job. That God, you must want somebody else. You, you don't belong in my living room. God, you don't want me. You want somebody else, somebody better. The answer from God. That doesn't matter. God is with us. Church family, we live in very anxious times right now. And yet we are called to be bringers of peace. We live in a dark world and we are called to be light to that world. And that feels like too much sometimes. That feels like an impossible task, like something that is just too big for us to wrap our hands around. But the hope and the peace and the joy and the love of Advent, that which can propel us in the face of our fears and our doubts and our unworthiness, can all be summed up in one word. Emmanuel. God is with us. I wonder, I don't know this for a fact, but I wonder if there were days in those nine months that Mary was carrying the Son of God, he who was also her son. I wonder if there were days when she looked down at her belly and said what she'd wanted to say to Gabriel. You don't belong here. I wonder if in that first trimester when nausea seized her, when she was vomiting in whatever they used for toilets back then, I wonder if she thought, you don't belong here. I wonder if in that second trimester as her, she felt her body changing, as it became more real to her, that soon enough she'd be giving birth to God's son. I wonder if she thought, you don't belong here. I wonder if in that third trimester, as she lost sight of her feet, if she thought to herself, this is all becoming too real. You don't belong here. You're holy and I'm a sinner. You're weak and I'm, you're strong and I'm weak. You're faithful and I'm fickle. You are heavenly and I am earthly. You don't belong here. But when Jesus was born, that night in Bethlehem, when Jesus was born, when heaven came down, and she looked Emmanuel in the eyes, I think God answered her concern and ours. He did so once and for all. This is exactly where I belong. Let's pray.
Lord, in, a, in an anxious, fearful world, we thank you for the peace of Advent. In a world where we often feel alone, we thank you that you are with us. God, I pray that you would assuage our fears and our doubts and our sense of unworthiness. And Lord, that you would remind us that we are not called to this alone, that you are with us even to the end of the age. May that bring us comfort. May that bring us strength. May that be our guidestone as we go forward. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.